So the title of my talk is Life and Death of a Brock, and that implies, of course, something of a biography of this place called the Cairns that we've been excavating for. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm alarmed to say 10 years now we've been excavating the site down in South Ronaldty. <coughs> and uh, a biography kind of implies almost in a sense that we're going to go through things in a slightly descriptive fashion and I'm afraid there will be a fair bit of description tonight and that's only natural within the detailing of a biography but I will intersperse it with moments of meaning and significance and interpretation as and when I see fit and as, a, 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 as things emerge that I hope are going to be quite significant and quite interesting for you. So, without <coughs> any further ado, here's the Cairns, or rather where the, the site is. For those of you who are native Orcadians, you won't uh, need much in the way of indication. We're down in the South Isles, we're down in the South Parish of South Royalty, and we're down in the South East side, that big bite that's taken out, that's known as Winnick Bay, on the South East side of South Royalty. And that's where the site is. It's not on the coast. For those that have the, that old uh, uh, thing in their head about rocks all being coastally located, they're not. But having said that, nowhere's too far from the coast in Orkney, and our site is maybe about 400 metres back from the sea itself. But the nearest portion of sea is very cliffy, as you can get a sense from this image here, where you can see the site at the uh, centre <coughs> of the photograph here. And that gives you a sense of how far back we are from the coast and across a burn to get to it. Quite beautiful location, as those of you that know the, the place well. Beautiful view over the North Sea on the east side. And the site sits about 40 metres, 43 metres above sea level, so it's not a massively high elevation. But in relative terms, locally, it actually does have a feeling of a much greater height. And you certainly have a prospect that uh, makes you feel like you're actually supervising and monitoring and observing the whole of this low, broad valley that runs from uh, the North Sea on the east side over to Scapa Flow on the west side, and there is a view of Scapa Flow there as well. So it's a very commanding view. And also the position of the site, and this is something we'll talk about more shortly as well, the position of the site means that anyone looking up the slope in the direction of that site 2,000, 2,500 years ago, would have seen this very uh, strong silhouette on the horizon, I think. And so I think probably a lot of that is part and parcel of the location of the site. Um, we're not the first to excavate the site, to fill you in a little bit of the, the, uh, another part of the biography of the site. Um, in 1901, the Reverend Alexander Goodfellow, he is the fine chap himself on the left, was excavating on this site. We've no reason, we've, we've no knowledge as to why. We never had any explanation what drew him there. All we have is a, a more or less a sort of small half a page account in a fairly obscure journal, which some of you will know though, which is the Saga Book of the Viking Club, published in 1903. He tells us that he encountered what he called a wheel. He's a, he's a good northeast lad. He was a good Dundonian coming from Lochie. And so he would have used this word wheel which its root comes from the Gallic cave to describe an underground structure. And in the northeast mainland of Scotland, that's what they call, what archaeologists would call, a souterrain, what we might call up here in the North and Earth House. So he thought he'd encountered a souterrain. He described it fairly well in terms of the measurements, the dimensions, and the shape of things. And one of the most important things he says to us is, not much was found. The typical antiquarian understatement, he says, not very much was found during the excavations. And then he rhymes off a litany of objects and materials, which includes things like shell and animal bone, pottery, some stone tools, some boar's tusks, and two fragments of human remains, uh, which really does make you wonder. And, and there are things that we've encountered lately on site, and which I'll go into in much more detail shortly, which really do make that statement very interesting, very relevant, and, and, and really quite intriguing. We were able to open. Uh, Goodfellow's backfill, essentially, we were able to re-excavate his trench and we were able to demonstrate that where he was actually excavated was inside the Brock entrance passage. Now, it turns out that as well as it being the Brock entrance passage, it was actually a souterrain. Later on, it became reused 
as the chamber of one of these underground Iron Age structures. So Goodfellow was right all along, but really he had no right to be right <laughs> in that sense. But that may be slightly unkind and slightly cruel. Uh, a fine figure he was though. And on the right hand side here is what we encountered at the very bottom of his excavations uh, back in uh, 2009, I think it was, 2009 season, and that was this, and with thanks to Rick in the audience for the, the image of this out of the ground, and it's Goodfellow's Kettle, which is wonderful, lovely. One of our prized artefacts from the site is indeed an artefact that is a, a wonderful uh, token of the archaeology of archaeology, in effect. And my guess is that he left that kettle there because he was marking out the level to which he reached in his excavations with the intent to return and do more work at a later date and he never did. That never occurred for various reasons. So the Good Fellow excavation is quite important. It's had only an incredibly minor impact on the otherwise fairly pristine nature of the archaeology. It's relatively undisturbed. He never even actually reached the bottom of the deposits inside that block entrance passage, which is good news for us because it means we're able to you know, excavate those and encounter those ourselves. But nonetheless, uh, he was there and it's quite significant and quite interesting that there was that episode of antiquarian work on the site. <coughs> Here's a view of the site, at least uh, one view of the site taken from a few years ago. And it really just emphasises the kind of riot of, of uh, stony remains that we have on the site. It's cairns by name, cairns by nature. It really is an incredible pile of stone. And actually, I visited a few years ago. He'd never been to the site before. I remember them arriving at the site. And from this angle, but from the ground level rather than from this elevated view, I think they said, oh, it's not much more than a fairly unimpressive pile of stone. <laughs> <laughs> I resisted taking exception to it, but actually when you wheel around to the other side of the site from here where we've gained much deeper uh, access to the, the very deeply stratified, very well preserved structures, it becomes somewhat more impressive. And in later years, in more recent years, um, we've been able to <coughs> excavate, uh, well now, even since that photo was taken, we've been able to clear the whole of the interior space of the broch from rubble and it's a very substantial and, and really quite well preserved structure it is and I'll go into that in a little bit more detail in just a moment. So there's great preservation on site, <coughs> the architectural remains are very well preserved, they allow us to think about the three dimensional architectural spaces that people were encountering and experiencing, that they were constructing, that they were inhabiting, that they were modifying. Uh, the block itself is well preserved, all, over two metres in height in, in most of its uh, circuit. Um, and there are also fully roofed three dimensional structures in the form of things like uh, our souterrain structure F on site. So, you know, there's great preservation, and to that extent, it's a very classic kind of working in very well preserved site. Uh, if you have many in another region of Europe in terms of that three dimensional preservation. And uh, <coughs> excuse me, just some views from last year of that brock itself to give you a sense of the kind of monumental scale of it. The brock essentially is the very thing that gives this mound of archaeological material its heart, effectively. It's the principal monument there. And lots of the, the rest of the biography of this place revolves around that brock for centuries after it's, it's constructed and, and in use. And indeed, the site has a very lengthy biography. I'll show you some hints of just how lengthy that is in just a moment, but it runs, as far as we know, at least from the later Neolithic period all the way through into the Viking period, in fact, into the Middle Norse period of the 12th, possibly 13th century. And there's uh, 18th and 19th century ridge and furrow over the top of it. And then there are these various, well, there's one antiquarian episode and a few other earlier um, uh, informal excavations on the site. So effectively, it runs from the Lake Neolithic as a place all the way up to almost the present day, and especially if we include our own excavations as just the latest episode of human attention on this place in the landscape. The Broch, though, is a principal monument, and there's an awful lot that I could tell you about this evening. There are multiple talks that I could and have given on various aspects of the archaeology of the site, but tonight I really just want to dwell principally on the birth 
the life, the later life, the death, and the immediate afterlife of the Brock itself. Having said that though, just for a moment, it's worthwhile reflecting on uh, some of the later structures that we have. In the immediate aftermath of the Brock, the site remains occupied. In fact, if anything, it seems to almost go into an even greater burgeoning episode of activity. There are all sorts of later Iron Age, post rock late Iron Age structures, features and buildings strewn across the remains of the rock itself and also cutting into the rock and truncating the walls of the rock in a way that's distinctly un-Arcadian for the Iron Age. In Orkney we very often have later activity, post rock activity within the Iron Age centering on reuse of the interior of rocks and also revolving around the exterior of rocks but what you very seldom get in Orkney is actual literal truncation of the, the fabric, the building fabric of the Brock itself by later buildings. So at the Cairns, you, if you think of the apple, uh, the, I did this in Edinburgh as well. I'm, I'm so used to giving this analogy that I trip myself up with it all the time. If you think of the Brock a little bit like an apple, all round the circumference of that apple there will be little individual bites taken out of it and into those bites, as it were, in the Brock, in the case of the Brock, there are later Iron Age buildings. <coughs> That's distinctly an Arcadian, and where you see that much more in evidence is in the aftermath of Brock's in Caithness and in Sutherland, where you do very often have interference, as it were, in the built fabric of the Brock itself. So that may or may not be interesting or relevant that Obviously, we're in the South Isles of Orkney and we're clo that little bit closer to Caithness in Sutherland. So clearly, Orkney, the South Isles of Orkney gave that tradition to Caithness, of course. <laughs> clearly, <laughs> rather than the other way around. And here's my colleague, Dr James Moore, just excavating one of those lovely later Iron Age features, a, a large hearth with its lovely, heart, uh, lovely um, uh, settings, almost certainly for um, supporting something like uh, uh, posts, uh, uh, a spit effectively, or a, a, a beam that would have held pots over the fire and the like. Um, so a lovely feature. And it's and some of the later Iron Age archaeology is very familiar with those that might have been uh, interested in sites like the How, excavated here near Stromness in the late 70s and early 80s, where these sorts of multicellular quite irregularly shaped, um, sometimes referred to as jelly babies or shamrocks, uh, figure of eight buildings. There's a whole variety of later Iron Age buildings and we very much have these in evidence at the Cairns, including that central building there, which is uh, a kind of an island building, sometimes known as a wag, and we certainly seem to have a, a very substantial one of those at the Cairns as well. <coughs> Excuse me. But so much for the later post-rock stuff, I want to move on. The artifactual assemblage in the pre Orcadian style is very rich and very substantial as well. We've got very good preservation, we've got, very, we've got a, a, a rich uh, litany of, of all sorts of different objects and material culture, as we call them, in archaeology. Very good preservation of, of um, copper alloy objects, bronze objects, more of those later. <coughs> um, ceramics, pottery stone tools, uh, vessels, um, and things like this, and more on these shortly as well. Top right here is a, a little selection of some of the 60 or 70 mould fragments that we've recovered from uh, just a small number of deposits on one part of the site. Really, really interesting. Really amazingly well-preserved moulds, and I'll tell you something about what we've been doing with those and indeed what some of our students have been doing with those in recent months, shortly. <coughs> and the usual multiple stone tools, the Northern Isles of Orkney and Shevron in particular are well known in British archaeology for the prolific stone tools. They're often the bridesmaid, as it were, to other types of object, but they're actually full of interesting information, full of not, full of full of insight into people's day-to-day -day -day lives for us. So we shouldn't really get them to the dustbin of mundanity, but actually appreciate them for what they are, which is the everyday tools of everyday people. I almost sound like I'm about to burst into song then. <laughs> I'll resist the temptation. And then a whole range of different ceramics, some very coarse. Some of our pottery, would you believe, is made from uh, cow dung, which is nice. 
Um, <laughs> and we've got several hundred shelves of that particular wear. I'm not quite sure what we're going to we, we call it organic tempered wear. That's <laughs> it's kind of a euphemism, really, for what it really is. But you believe it or not, apparently, it is, it's done. Um, and we go from that, and I don't have a picture of it, I'm afraid. I, I've got a picture of some other done later on for you, but it's a different sort of a done altogether. But we go from that very coarse pottery to much finer stuff, and indeed some decorated items. And these are, these are the types of pots in the Middle Iron Age period, in the period of the brocks, which are often seen to be, or have been suggested to be, relatively high status, often accompanying uh, people's uh, social lives in terms of sharing food and drink, uh, those meals, those communal meals, undertaken within quite formal spaces like the interiors of rocks. And a lot of this style of pottery, including decorated stuff, is indeed so far at this stage coming out of what we see as quite formally weighed out context, like the interior of the rock itself. Deposition is also wonderful on site. We've got this amazing deposition. We've got things like this. So the, the main picture here is a fragments of a rotary quern deposited in the roof of our suitery and actually built in as one of the construction features. I'll talk about that as well shortly in more detail. Um, and there, there's that the kind of well-known feature within Iron Age Scotland and Iron Age Britain of taking what appear on the face of it to be relatively mundane objects and almost kind of, and I will use the word more than once tonight, ritualising these apparently common or garden objects by bringing them into other sorts of contexts, other sorts of situations depositionally. So we'll often find objects like querns, grinding stones for grinding out the flour to make da the daily bread, or grinding the barley to make the beer for the daily beverage. We find these objects taken and in placed into foundation deposits. We find moments of transition on the site, important seminal moments of change on the site we find marked out through the apparently deliberate deposition of objects like these apparently ordinary everyday items like querns, or more ordinary everyday items, but again elevated out of their mundanity, a cache of 12 so-called long-handled weaving cones deposited in the pot that you see in fragmentary form there, placed near to the threshold of one of our post-rock, immediately post-rock buildings at a moment in time when that building was being deliberately ended, put out of, out of use. Or things like this, the, the image on the left there, it's a bit grainy, but the, you just about perceive the checkerboard style arrangement there. That's our sampling process as we excavate the floor of a, an Iron Age house on a sampling grid and we're, we're alternating the squares of soil that we're taking out of there to keep spatial control over it. And as we we're doing that in this particular building, Structure H. We encountered the, the object that's shown in close up there, which is the butt end of an almost certainly late Neolithic polished stone axe. Now that had been placed in the floor deposit next to the hearth of this Iron Age building some two and a half thousand years after it was actually made and in currency in later Neolithic society, but had been picked up, found, acquired, procured in some way by the later Iron Age inhabitants of this place and then had been dealt with in a depositional, term, in, in a depositional way and been placed in the ground in, at the moment when a building was being founded. Or this one again, which is a, a passageway built into one of our late Iron Age buildings, structure B. It's partially stepped. This is the passageway. It's partially reusing the masonry of the brock. And in the floor of it, you have one, two, three, four, five fragments of a, again, a rotary quern deliberately broken up and placed in as the paving of that passageway. And in that same deposit, that foundational deposit, were the remains of a whole cat skinned and laid out as an articulated specimen, portions of a juvenile pig and portions of another small ungulate, which is a, a name for a, a small grazing animal, but which we can't really quite define um, to species because it's so juvenile. So these weird depositional events accompany a lot of the activity, a lot of the change and uh, transformation that we experience on the site, phase by phase. 
And then, of course, there's the famous <coughs> Win It Wally or McCarran's character. Choose your, choose your, your moniker, as you will. Um, and, but, you know, very incredibly rare to get figurative, literally figurative representations or anthropomorphic representations of persons or beings, at least. Who knows what this is meant to represent? Is he, is he a person? Is she a person? Is he a person? Who was literally a, a living member of that community represented here? Or is it a representation of a deity or an ancestor or some supernatural entity? Or is it just a joke? Who knows? The point is, it's very rare to have that kind of figurative representation. And then this doesn't show very well, but it's another one. ABG stands for animal bone drip. And the aforementioned animal bone drips that were found inside uh, the passageway of that structure B building are, are just the tip of the iceberg. We're starting to realise now that we potentially have dozens and dozens and dozens of these bone groups, these fully articulated or partially articulated animals that are being laid to rest in the ground at important junctures in the life of the site, actually marking the biography of the site itself in terms of the consciousness of the of the Iron Age inhabitants of the site. And this is another one. This is a, a two portions of juvenile red deer which were split but which retained their natural bone positions. You know, they, were, they retained articulation and they're deposited under the hearth of, a, of, a, of one of the other Iron Age buildings. So there's this emphasis on deposition. Um, the rains, I won't bore you to tears uh, along the lines of reading out these bullet points, but effectively, uh, Elaine's have grown over the years as we've understood the scope of the site to, uh, you know, to, be, to become capable of, of, of answering so many more questions. But effectively, we want to understand the Broch. We want to excavate the Broch. We want to understand the landscape that the Broch was part of, both in social or cultural terms, political or economic terms, in terms of the other sites, the other places that are in that landscape, but also in terms of the natural places of that landscape as well. Um, and we also want to investigate these underground structures, something very close to my heart. And I won't talk too much about them tonight because I could just spend all night talking about them left on my own devices. So it's probably best that I don't, therefore. But I will bring them up a little bit, for sure. Um, and it's worth, at this stage, simply reposing the question that it that I have in my head quite often, and that's why dig another rock? Why do another rock at all? What's the point of it? I hope to be able to show you the point of it shortly, but at this stage it's worthwhile recalling or recognising that it's never really been the case that anyone has fully excavated the full suite of occupation and flow deposits from inside of a rock from the very end of its life use to its very beginning in the modern era with the full suite of scientific, methodological, analytical and theoretical tools that are now available to contemporary archaeology. No one has done that any time recently. Even the, the wonderful excavations of Old Scatmus and Shetland stopped short of excavating the in situ earlier primary floor deposits inside the rock simply because there they wanted to put on display some of the very wonderful architecture that they had there and there were two subsequent phases of buildings constructed inside the shell of the block which prevented them from getting to the in-situ flow deposit. So when people say to us, well why dig another block? Hasn't it been done before? Don't we know what was happening in the blocks? Haven't we established what they were for? Don't we know when precisely they dig to? Don't we know what the relationship between blocks and other buildings in the contemporary settlements with them was? Don't we know what social, political, economic, cultural role Brock's had? The simple answer is no, we don't really. And archaeologists have been debating this sort of thing for over 150 years now without really resolving it entirely clearly. So that's why we're digging another block. So on to our biography, and I'll, and I'll speed up a little bit. So the birth of our site, we reckon, I reckon, at this stage, we don't have any carbon dates for it. I think probably before too long we will have, and my guess is that, that's, that the Brock is born sometime in the early to mid first millennium BC. <coughs> before the Brock even gets built, 
And this, I hope, will give you an indication of the, the volume of effort and energy that was required to put this monument, monument and building into being. Before the block ever gets built, they're having to really work the land, they're having to transform the landscape in order to construct this structure. Before they've even potentially acquired the building materials and brought them to the location, the 1,500 to 2,000 tonnes of masonry that that is reckoned to have involved, before they get there, they have to, to have to make a big change to the landscape in various ways. So the site itself sits on a slope, and I'll go into this tiny bit of detail in just a moment. It's such a slope that they actually had to prepare that slope, they had to cut into it, they had to terrace it, they had to move potentially hundreds of tons, if not thousands of tons of earth and boulder clay before they could ever actually just plonk that rock straight down. So why are they there? What, what, why are you occupying this, this slope, this 1 in 20 sloping portion of the landscape? Well, there's a number of reasons why they might be there. One of them is this, as I hinted at the beginning, there is a Neolithic precursor to the site. So this is the geophysics. This here uh, is, oops, this thing here is uh, almost certainly a Neolithic settlement. We've test pitted it before. We found it to contain late Neolithic grooved ware pottery, plain grooved ware pottery in copious quantities. Even in a one by one metre test bit, we found dozens and dozens and dozens of shards of later Neolithic pottery. So that anomaly there, immediately to the north of the site, to the north of the, uh, the Brock site, it appears to be a Neolithic settlement, maybe many other things as well. The Brock, of course, is the central anomaly there. The black and white stripes on that, incidentally, are medieval, late medieval, post medieval, uh, rich in furrow agriculture, mostly, but not entirely. There's also, you know from excavations, <coughs> from test pitting are in the vicinity between that Neolithic rise and our main trench, but there's almost certainly a, a later Bronze Age or the early Iron Age episode in the history of this place in the landscape as well. So before the Brock gets built, sometime we think towards the end of the, uh, sorry, towards the end of the early Iron Age or the beginning of the Middle Iron Age, there actually has been something there dating to the Iron Age before that. So you get a sense almost of the, the biography of this wider landscape moving from north to south over time. It meanders, there's a ribbon of settlement that meanders or drifts in a linear fashion really I should say from north to south from the late Neolithic through to the Middle Iron Age. So the presence of that Neolithic monument here might be something that's relevant to understanding why they've chosen that location in the landscape and in Orkney in particular there's a very a strongly recognisable tradition in the Iron Age of revisiting much earlier places and sites in the landscape, including the reuse, reoccupation, remodelling uh, of later Neolithic tombs and, uh, to some extent, other features as well, like the stones of Stenax, for instance. So it might be that they're interested in acquiring a relationship with the remains of the Neolithic locally. And one might say, one might guess that that might be tied into inheritance, ancestry, claims over land and tenure, the ability to point to somewhere that's clearly of antiquity, of deep antiquity, and be able to say, this landscape is our landscape because we've inherited it from the people who, who were here before, the people who are our ancestors, perhaps. That may be part of it. Now I said it's a sloping world and they had to deal with that. As I say, there's a 1 in 20 uh, slope that they're facing, which is not ridiculously steep, but it's pretty damn steep when you consider what that meant that was over the, that, over the, the, um, the, the diameter of the brock, which is about 22 metres in external diameter. The ground from the northwest to the southeast dropped over the distance of that 22 metres by just about 2 metres. So that's an incredible drop in height to combat in order to create a level. So basically what they've done is they've cut upslope 
I think probably vertically down, and then dug down maybe two metres or more, and then scalped the ground across to create a level platform, a terrace effectively, onto which they've then started to build the broch. And that, that must have required an incredible amount of earth movement before they've even got round to laying the first foundation course of the broch. So it just gives you a sort of insight into the seriousness of the endeavour. And the reason that I can say what I've just said with relative confidence is everywhere that we've excavated on the outer circumference of the broch and where we've reached the base, the footings of the broch wall, around three locations around the circumference of the broch, we've actually taken readings using our total station, etc. So we've surveyed them in, and the foot of the broch in all cases is within two or three centimetres of each of the three locations. That's despite the fact that the natural slope is different at 1 to 20. So it stands to reason they must have built this, they must have cut down and built this terrace before putting the broch down. And everywhere where we've, we've encountered the very base of the broch, we can see they've scalped away any topsoil, turf, um, any earlier archaeological soils that were there, placed the broch straight down on the natural glacial till. So they really have prepared that ground surface in a really quite thorough and effective manner. And what do they do with all that soil and earth? Well, the base of two metres of our rock is a little bit of a sham. It's what they call a solid base rock. That's to say that the chambers, the galleries that you expect inside the thickness, the wall thickness of a rock, they don't start in the case of our rock, and in the case actually of most Orcadian rocks, until you get to about two metres in height. So the basal platform, basal two metres platform of the rock is composed of solid material. But it's not composed of solid stonework right the way across the wall thickness. It's got this stuff in it. Where are Pictish archaeologists, that's to say, or later Iron Age occupants of the site have dug down through the rock walls, as I've discussed earlier on, they've actually revealed in truncated form. So here's the broch wall, here's the outer wall face, here's the wall thickness running off into the background. They've smashed through that broch wall in order to create their, their, their building. And in doing that, they've given us on site a sneaky peek of what that wall is made of. We're able to see into the wall thickness. And it's the boulder clay, it's the soil, it's the earth, it's all the brook that was dug out of that terrace has been dumped into the wall core of the broch in its basal two metres. Maybe not all of it, because there would have been a lot more earth probably than is contained within uh, the effectively the casement wall of the foundations of the rock. Nevertheless, a fair bit. So that's quite interesting in terms of what they're doing before the rock ever gets built. And they've got ready supplies of stone, they've got vast quantities of stone in the neighbourhood, they've got lots of stones for making stone tools on the, the beach nearby at Winnick. And they've also got some really pretty, pretty mighty slabs and blocks of masonry that they can use for things like or massive lintel stones, but a dozen of which were used to span the roof of the single entrance, east facing entrance that led into the rock. And just to give you a sense of the, scar the, the size and the uh, monumental nature, but we're almost talking about megalithic construction here. So of course, in order to move these collapsed lintels that still remained in place, partly choking the entrance passage of the broth, we had to um, get a machine in to help us to do that. Now, one of the first features that we, that we create when the, when, the, when the building of the broth, as we now know, as we, we know from 2015 season excavations, is an underground structure. What is normally known in the archaeological parlance or certainly in our age studies as a well. It's again a very mundane and very prosaic and, and really quite relegatory or dismissive term for really just what a sophisticated and interesting piece of architecture this feature and features like actually are. This so-called well was constructed, we can tell, as one of the primary features of the rock. That huge earth movement that they've undertaken actually brought them closer to the head of the bedrock in order to construct this thing in the first place. You'll see that I have put um, ditties around the term well, and I won't go into huge details this evening, but suffice to say, I'm rather sceptical that these are normal, ordinary, everyday wells, and anyone who's familiar at all with the archaeology of mine, how excavated between the years 2000 and 2005 by as the archaeology 
Institute, as we all know, will know that actually they can be accompanied by some pretty amazing deposits and activities, suggesting that there are far more interesting and powerful places and features than just simply for drawing off water. But it is what it is, it's a feature that's constructed down as one of the primary features of the broch itself. It was full of water when we first encountered it. That's a picture of us pumping out some of that water from a few years ago. This coming season, we'll be, we'll be undertaking the full excavation of the deposits in there. So that'll be very interesting to find out really what's going on. The well is sealed only by the uppermost occupation deposit of the floor deposits inside the brock. And that means that it appears that it was retained as an accessible feature throughout the life of the brock. So despite the fact that it's constructed at the very beginning of the brock, they ensure that it remains accessible throughout the whole of the subsequent biography of that brock, possibly three or four hundred years of life years, maybe even more. And it's only the final floor deposit that seals that well. And in fact, one of our animal bone groups, the, a vertebral column from a juvenile cattle, uh, was deposited on the lid, on the closing slab, of that, rock, of that uh, well structure. It's got steps down into it, and it's worth, it's worth telling you right now, it appears in the northern half of the brock, and the stairs that descend down into it are, there, are running in an anti-clockwise fashion, which is kind of intriguing, given what I'm going to tell you in just a moment, I hope. Um, as I said, lots of parallels for these sorts of things. They've usually been excavated like potatoes in, uh, in Iron Age, excavations and not being treated with a great deal of care and attention. We haven't previously recovered numerous samples, for instance, on a, a very controlled fashion to actually see what, what sorts of things are in them. So that's one of the things we'll do this year, is excavate it with as much due care and attention as we possibly can and try to get really get to the bottom of, of, of what these things are all about. And as I say, there's examples elsewhere from what we put in the wonderful the central picture there on the top centre of the government itself which is a wonderful example and really makes the point that these things are way more than just simple wells it's so architecturally elaborate and complex uh, even including hidden passageways and chambers behind the main staircase which were only accessible when you slid out some of the stone treads um, to gain access to the hidden chambers behind it evokes a certain sense of secrecy, hiddenness, uh, control of access, regulation of access and experience that probably means these are quite rarefied places that not everybody goes into, and certainly not everybody goes into in an ordinary everyday way, perhaps. So that's our well type structure. I'll not say too much more about it. As I say, it's only sealed by the final floor. And what comes in interesting here is this business of it descending in an anti-clockwise fashion because we have a wonderful intramural staircase, the remains of an intramural staircase within the thickness of the wall of the brock itself. And like 100% of all wall staircases in brocks found across the whole of Scotland, it rises in a clockwise fashion, it rises in a normal sunwise direction. So you elevate your way up within the thickness of the wall of the brock in that very normal sunrise direction. As soon as you enter underground <coughs> qualities of space, you're often taken in a contrary direction, you're taken in an anti-clockwise, anti-sunwise direction. And that's another element of the weirdness, suggestive of the strangeness, the dizzying, disorientating, abnormalizing experience of these underground structures, in, in my view. So that, in tandem with the fact that the Broch and the Well have this uh, uh, contemporary construction to them, uh, tends to make me think that in the very inception of the Broch, there's a kind of formalised layout and there's, a, and there's a formalised meaning, there's an idealised set of meanings and values related to the occupation of the interior of that Broch and its architectural spaces. And they're part and parcel of, of an overall effect that one takes on board when one is inside the broth, or using the broth, or living in the broth, or visiting the broth. And even if these underground structures are nothing more than 
the resources, the, the, the effectively uh, storehouses, underground storerooms, cellars and the like, for sustaining that mass workforce who are assembled to construct the block. Even if it's only that that they're put to, that in itself is really important because that is the kind of inception of the household who themselves are going to live in this building. It's part and parcel of the important social currency and negotiation, the social relations of sharing food, of offering assistance and food to the workforce they've assembled to help you construct this monumental behemoth in the first place. And so even if it is that very practical storeroom that these wells and citrines represent, the fact that they're then left or kept open and accessible for hundreds of years means that they have a burgeoning biography that runs alongside the buildings that they're part of. What I would suggest, in effect, is that they become house shrines because they are, they are very early primary parts of the house itself. And over time, that house that's occupied, the block itself that's occupied for many generations, is itself, it takes on almost a moral and a religious content to it, as well as a, as well as a house, in that sense. Now the Brock is amazing because there's some amazing features in it. It's got cells and chambers within it. It's got four or five of these within the, the thickness of the wall. There's one called the Red Cell, which is a little one. And it's called the Red Cell. We nicknamed it the Red Cell because when we excavated it, it was completely plastered in red clay. So the dry stone masonry was completely hidden from view behind a red clay render. And that was quite remarkable. When we peeled that red clay render off to sample the clay, in various ways we found that there was a yellow clay behind it so it's almost like the wallpaper had been replaced over time and it's as if you were stepping <coughs> off the wallpaper and seeing the earlier life of the room behind it and that uh, oops, that cell is, uh, is a tiny one over here relatively tiny up here but the one next to it the big daddy cell is a so-called yellow cell in Funnily enough, that's because it was covered in yellow clay when we first encountered it. And it, that's it there. And it even had, in the midst of that yellow clay, it had things like shells impressed in patterns into the surface of the clay, presumably in a kind of design <coughs> format. So there were little chevrons or diamonds of arrangements of limpet shells pressed into that clay. We couldn't really believe what we were seeing when we first un uh, uncovered that because that kind of thing is rock architecture before you have the yellow cell and the red cell. And then just last season, we, we, we found the west cell, the last remaining portion of, of rubble choking the interior of the rock was removed and we found the opening into a complete cell that's still roofed over, still has its intact roof. So we've done very little work with that so far, but it looks as if it's really big, really substantial. It's entirely pristine and we're really looking forward to getting into it. So there's a number of spaces available within the broch. There's a number of chambers that open off the interior of it. And there's also, as I mentioned before, there's the intramural staircase. There's a staircase, just the vestigial remains of a staircase, three stairs left in that staircase. It's really fascinating now to see that staircase starts effectively on the wall head of the broch. So it starts at 1.8 metres above the currently reached floor surface inside the rock, um, which is interesting because what we've got on the top of the wall, adjacent to it, and I don't know if you can make this out, I hope you can, there's some especially big slabs or blocks of masonry, all on one level, pitched at somewhere around about 2 metres, 1.8 metres to 2, two metres above um, the interior floor surface. This is the remains of a scarce ledge that would have helped to prop up uh, wooden, probably entire wooden floors within inside the rock building itself. Now the staircase doesn't start till above that level, which implies there was another floor that that staircase reached, set high up above, possibly another two metres above that. So you've got the ground floor, which is an 11 metre diameter, which is quite a big space in its own right, and you've got another version of it above that, set at 1.8 metres, and then above that, potentially another one as well. So the floor space available inside the centre of the rock is really quite substantial. And then you think probably a, a very large roof on top of the whole lot, so a really substantial space indeed. 
and here's some pictures of the evolving, developing interior of the Brock. We're starting to get a fixity, a, a, a proper understanding of the architectural way we're recovering the uprights, the orthostatic partitions and compartments that have been set up in the interior of the Brock and which reflect the use of the space, they demarcate rooms and chambers and cells within the, within the space and building. And we can even therefore kind of recover something of the flow of movement. Hopefully you can make out the lurid arrows indicate the sense of movement. So here's the main, just south of east facing entrance to the broad. You pass through a nice stout wooden door. There's an inner entrance passage which would have regulated your movement forward. Another corridor effectively. That corridor then turns a corner. Uh, in a left hand direction through between a wall and uprights and then there's a door that, that allows you to enter into a, a southeastern room set against the broth wall interior over here or you could continue on into a southern room here there's a door here that leads into a northern room this northern room is a much wider apparently less differentiated arc of space set in the western the northwestern side of the rocks, all of that seems to be undifferentiated. And there's the, the entrance into the well. And then finally, there's another doorway into a northeastern uh, room set against the, the northeastern side of the interior of the rock. So there's quite a strong sense of the movement and how you would access the various internal uh, uh, compartments and arrangements within the rock. And it looks like more or less that space was governed in a roughly clockwise direction around the interior of the rock, which means that, that that strange architectural effect of turning around on oneself and heading down in an anti-clockwise fashion that I had mentioned in relation to the well is amplified even further because to get to the well over here you have to make your way around all of this space to get to it and then when you do get to it you suddenly you're turning in an opposite direction and you're going in an anti-clockwise direction. So that kind of, what, what is sometimes archaeologists call monumental choreography, that choreography of the space and the movement inside the building would have been productive of a certain kind of effect and attitude and almost certainly would have been tied into the social relations of the inhabitants of that rock, whether you were male or female, whether you were senior or inferior, whether you were a generationally long-lived member of that Brock household or whether you were someone who'd recently married into it or indeed whether you were of very low social status, almost servile, maybe they even had slaves in those households we don't really know, <coughs> or whether you were at the very top of the social pyramid. All of that space would have mediated these different qualities of social relationship that you would have had with people, including presumably where you slept, where you ate, where you entered rooms, when you entered rooms, if you entered certain rooms. Lots of control, lots of regulation, probably. A very strong social and moral order to Iron Age households, almost certainly. As well as the Brock, what other elements are round about it that are, what we think are contemporary? There's things like uh, the great ditch enclosure, which we're, we have from the geophysics and partially through excavation as well. So we think there's a massive ditch around it, a little bit when you get to the Brock and Gunness. Oops. And uh, we think that's probably contemporary. We certainly will be proving that over the next season or two. Here's a picture of the upper elements of some of those ditch fills potentially on the northern side of the site. And ditches are massive, they're monumental, they're boundaries. They're not just defensive, we think, in the Iron Age, but also demarcate those that are inside from those that are outside. They help to foster a sense of identity, a sense of community. There are weird places in terms of deposition. There are fragments of human remains or some things deposited in them. Objects that come from exotic areas of the, of the world find their way into it, including ranges of Roman objects, objects from Shetland, which, yes, I did say it, it's an exotic place, but relative to, relative to Iron Age, Iron Age Orcadians, it wasn't what they, so therefore I'm calling it slightly exotic. But you know, things like steatite, soapstone, that's only found in Shetland. These are the types of objects that are finding their way into ditches. And archaeologists tend to think that's because when an object is at the end of its use, it doesn't come from inside that community, you have to deal with it in a very specific manner maybe in a ritualistic manner, maybe depositing it in 
what anthropologists would call a liminal place, a boundary, neither inside nor outside. I'll leave that to permeate and, to, and for you to cogitate over at a later juncture. It doesn't really matter too much, but it's one of the contemporary elements. And this, you make no head or tail of this whatsoever, because at this stage we can't make really any great deal of head or tail of it either. But it's, it's the extramural settlement. It's part of the complex of buildings that lies between the rock and the ditch um, of, of the enclosed space around uh, the rock itself. Suffice to say, we think there's a very substantial village. Kind of like the way that Gunness has put on display to the public today. So those we think are contemporary elements, but there's a great debate in Iron Age studies about just how contemporary these villages are. Here's some pictures of some other ones that have previously been excavated from Gunness to the top left, Lingro, not far from Cutwall, of course, down at the Scapa distillery, more or less bulldozed in the 1980s. Uh, how fully excavated in the late 70s, early 80s, and mid, of course, on Rousey. And you can see those complex arrangements of buildings around them. There's a debate in Iron Age studies about how contemporary those villages are. Because if you think about it, before our rock was put there, there's an early Iron Age site there, but it's probably only a small, it's probably only a little hamlet, a couple of buildings. We also know that there's another early Iron Age settlement 500 metres to the southeast that we previously excavated down closer to the bay. So we think that these dispersed settlements in the early Iron Age, late Bronze Age, early Iron Age, and when you get to the middle Iron Age, we suddenly go, bang, everybody converges around these rocks. So it would seem, and you have this nucleation of settlement, as it's known, this centralisation of settlement. And what we want to do is understand what the process of that is, what are the reasons for this? Why on earth do they change? Why do we have this oscillation in the landscape from being quite far flung out in the landscape to coming together in relatively large numbers of people? So that at Gunness, it's been estimated by John Hedges that the community there could have been anything up to 350 people or more resident at Gunness in its heyday. Okay, the life of the drop. <laughs> The life of the rock, or at least the later part of the life, you can never recover a full biography of an object, thank you, an object or a person or a place in archaeology, really. Um, but nevertheless, there will be a full biography to come when we get uh, through more of, of, of the excavation um, as seasons go on. But what we can reflect on is that at least the later life of the rock. And we can do that because of the excavation that's occurred uh, on the inside of the rock up to this day. And the wonderful thing is we've got what appear to be very well-preserved floor deposits or occupation deposits inside the rock. So this picture, just a picture, an overview of, of floor deposits inside the rock. And what you're seeing here, slightly confusing perhaps, but what you've got here is black organic material pale brown deposit above it, and then a very vivid yellow orangey deposit above that. Um, and above that, although it's been excavated at this stage, round about where the red and white rod is, we had another very thick black organic deposit above it. And what we're seeing here are stripes, alternating bands or stripes of different floors that have been uh, building up inside the rock. And they're announcing themselves to us as discrete floor entities through their individual characteristics. And what the process seems to be is that the inhabitants are laying out thick, quite clean clay, yellowy clay, basically as an earthen floor. They may be beating it a little bit to make it a, a harder, more compact surface, but probably in all likelihood, they're just, you know, it's just being made compact and solidified through the passage of, of feet over time. During the life, the use life of the rock, bags of charcoal, bags of charred cereal grain, thousands and thousands and thousands of charred barley grains from the interior of the rock, possibly because they're storing large volumes of grain, and that is possibly something of the economic basis of the wealth of the household of the rock, and that's something that we, we intend to examine more and more as we excavate. So there's lots of these environmental remains, there are potting fragments, there's lots of critters, there's lots of microfauna, as we call them, Lots of mice and voles that are sitting there eating the stuff. There's cat bones in there as well, so they didn't have it all their own way. And there's lots of micro artifacts like this 
uh, tiny glass bead, yes that is a one pence piece and yes that is a polychromatic glass bead, that's to say a deliberately multicoloured bead with an opaque yellow uh, pasty glass and a translucent ultramarine glass and it's almost certainly broken from a Romano-British bracelet which is uh, the type of artefact you normally see those colourings in and then it's been refashioned into a tiny little glass bead, just a third of which is preserved pins, metal pins from the floor of the bra. So this one that came up last time. It's a nice bronze copper alloy pin. Uh, I, I have another type of pin or rather a needle like a part of a, 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 you know, a sewing kit effectively. Hopefully you can see the perforation where it's been strung. Objects like this, and I'm not entirely sure what they are, but they're found fairly prolifically in Iron Age contexts. Um, some kind of strap or edge binding or mount of some description presumably or actually a pegged piece suggested that they're sometimes used anything from boxes of a, a ubiquitous nature to musical instruments to parts of uh, weaving uh, tools or kits uh, in relation to things like looms and the like. We're not really sure, but this is a pen of detritus that's coming from the Brock interior. <coughs> now, Structure K, which is contemporary with this later use of the Brock, we think, or at least an episode, in Structure K. This is one of the, the extra mural buildings. It's partly built over the infilled remains of the ditch, which is filled up by this point later in the life of the rock. And structure K is really interesting because of what's coming out of it. There's things like pins, but they can make out a fragment of a bronze pin. But there's also evidence for metalwork in the form of wet stones. There are furnaces for smelting iron and smithing iron. <coughs> and there are these things. Dozens of them, dozens and dozens of them, these moulds for making bronze jewellery, for making copper alloy jewellery. This is a penannular brooch, you can see the two heads, uh, the terminals rather, and the ring and brooch. This is probably a simple ring, bronze ring, this one's been used to make. And one of our master's students, Ben, who's in the audience, too. it's wonderful, he's going on to do a PhD soon. He's won a scholarship to do a PhD somewhere else. But that's good, we wish him, we wish him great. Great fortune and good luck and, uh, and great amounts of enjoyment in his new PhD career to come. But uh, Ben's been involved in lots of work on these moulds, including the three dimensional. Oops. Is it not picking up the video? Doing little 3D renditions of the moulds. I dare say, I don't want to dwell on this because my ugly kipper will come up in a minute and it will show my face. But I just wanted to show you a part of this video. I'll call it the front. Just some of the, the mold fragments. And Ben's been reproducing. Actually, 3D printed bronze versions of the pins, which are only known to us from the side via, so you can pass that around the audience. We only know about the existence of these pins from the side via the moulds, and Ben has been able to reproduce. We don't want that. <laughs> okay. So, the old age of the rock, it's getting a bit on now, probably mid to late second century AD or onwards and there's a series of deposits, there's some weird stuff going on in the broch there's uh, lots of burning episodes against the inside of the broch wall which have singed and scorched and cracked the masonry there's lots of fish the fish is really, really, really rare in the Iron Age you know, it's really counterintuitive but in the middle Iron Age, the period of the broch even when they've got plenty from seas around them they're not really into fishing, they don't really do a lot of fishing. And the fish that are found are usually in very small deposits on Iron Age sites. The, the tiny sage, the, the sprats of the sage, the basilix in the local vernacular, there's not very many of them. At the cairns, in the, in the final, we don't know what the period is, maybe the final weeks or months of the site at this stage, there's thousands of these fish inside the rock, and it's intriguing in terms of of another little biography that I'll just finish the talk off with in, in just a moment or two. But lots and lots of fish bones from these later stages. And what we think they're doing is 
that the burnt episodes, which are the really devil may care, they really clearly don't care about the long term structural integrity of the broth any longer at this stage, because what they're doing is scorching, discolouring, and cracking the masonry of, of the broth internally. So clearly they're not interested in that long term life of it at this point. But the fires seem to be associated with the fish bones, the thousands and thousands of fish bones. And what it looks like they're doing is trimming the heads and tails off and they're, they're splitting them and they're smoking them up in the broth itself and possibly also boiling the livers to procure oil for lamps and also for making leather more supple and things like that, which are all ethno-historically attested in Orkney and Shetland. And there's just some of the fish bones. <coughs> And there's a general feeling of kind of, I'd hesitate to say it, but a kind of malaise in terms of the previous social order, the very tight order of <laughs> orchestration and the kind of slight neatness of the block. Now there are haphazard hearts and burning episodes, little informal burnt episodes around the interior of the block and, and, and in the chambers of the block. And there's even things like some of these later ashy, fish rich deposits actually surmount little flags, stones, which when we propped them up, we could put them back in place. So there was the fishy deposit was over this slab. And when we removed the fishy deposit, we found this slab. And lo and behold, we could refit it onto its neighboring author stack. So even the sense of demarcation of the space, that format, formal layer of the interior of the block is giving way at this point in time. It's, it's giving way to some, some informality. And then also these things. And I've chosen some less than very obvious versions of it this evening, but some of them are very, very vivid. Some of the ones we've recovered, these are coprolites, these are fossilised feces from the site. And there are many, many thousands of these from these later deposits inside the block itself. So there's something of the, the old age of the block is, is, is being seen in this, in this informality, this dissolution of the block. And at the very end of the block, the death of the block itself, thousands of stones are brought down or reduced in the interior of the rock. The whole height of the rock is reduced to the level that we see it at today in the excavations. And we would put this around about the mid to late second century AD. There are weird things going on at the very end. There are some of these animal bone groups are laid out. There are whole pots laid out on the floor. And then someone takes a huge slab and we just smash them down on the pot so that when we lifted the slab, this particular slab, we lifted up lifted it off, we started to see the dozens and dozens of pottery shared smashed in situ. And then when we looked at the underside of the slab, the base of the pot, the whole base of the pot, was still stuck uh, to the underside of the slab. So the, the pot had been set upside down in the ground. In fact, three of them had been set next to each other, each other upside down. And then somebody came along with a big slab and just dropped it on the pots and smashed them to smithereens. And in so doing, broke a, a lamp in two pieces as well next to the, the opening into the well feature. That's just another picture of that pot. <coughs> and some more pictures of this, these later episodes, these later deposits inside the build, inside the block, including a close up of some of the ceramics. And then a picture of some of the ceramic spreads in the lab afterwards. And some of the animal bone groups recovered. So whole portions articulated cattle, sheep, deer and the like laid out apparently uh, just before they start to fill in, the way that we fill in the broth interior. But the well is signed out for special treatment. They, they really pack in the rubble and clay <coughs> over the top of where the well uh, was as if they're really capping and sealing that feature. And then, and I'm showing this almost in reverse effect in terms of excavation, and then the upper, maybe two thirds or more of the superstructure of the broch are dismantled and the rubble is cast into the interior and outside the exterior of the broch itself. So that in 2009, that's kind of what, what the broch looked like. Filled up the rubble. So that's the inner circumference there. <coughs> and there's some folk arranged around it, helpfully, just to indicate it even further. And there are objects placed in that rubble and fill, like saddle crowns and things like this. And then the immediate afterlife, so the almost final stage of the biography, in terms of what I wanted to talk about tonight, 
in the bit, again, a bit of mid-second century AD. <coughs> Hot on the heels of all those fish deposits and the infill in the rubble. There's one area of the block that they don't fill in with rubble, and it's that entrance passage, the, the same entrance passage that the Rev Goodfellow was in. <coughs> and what they do instead is they build a wall <coughs> at the inner end, just as the entrance passage is about to open up into the interior of the rock. They built the wall, the full height of the rock passageway. At this point in time, we've got good evidence that the, the passageway was still fully roofed over with those big lintel stones. And effectively, what they're doing is they're creating a revetment wall that holds back the rubble that's now choking the interior of the rock, and it remains or it retains uh, the entrance passage as a, as a, a space, still a, a three dimensional space that they can do things in. And what they're actually doing, which is fascinating, is they're converting it into a chamber of a sutra, hence good fellow was right. What he didn't know is that there's this long, elaborate built passageway is created <coughs> in order to access that old rock entrance passage, which now, covered in rubble, both externally and internally, has more of a feeling of an underground space than it does the upstanding entrance into that building as it was for several centuries before this. So that passageway is built in uh, the mid to late second century AD and itself, you, you entered it from the south, came past, came through another reused rocky building in here and then at this point it kinks dramatically round in an anti-clockwise direction to the, to the left hand side and enters into the chamber the block and bear in mind that's where Goodfellow says he found two pieces of human remain. Here's another view of that situated passage with the roof off now in the excavations and some other views of it. <coughs> and when we first encountered it, it was covered in clay, there was a clay cap there, there was one area full of shell, 120 uh, <laughs> shells, periwinkle shells if you want to know the exact number and when we excavated that deposit of shells we found that they'd been used to fill in space above those rotary quills that I showed a picture of earlier on. So this stone setting was deliberately made around the rotary quill and fragments. Uh, the shell was placed on top. The fragments of rotary quill are arranged over the fragments of another rotary quill underneath with the holes through, and when we excavated the roof of the suturane, we found that right where that rotary quill had been placed, and the installation and the shells above, they had done something funny in the roof. So instead of these straightforward lintels bridging the passageway, at this point, near the entrance to the suturane, they, they put one large slab diagonally across, placed one slab over and a minor slab over there, and created a, a hole or a space. And that's exactly what they aligned the rotary quill holes through and the shell uh, setting with the shells. And what we're thinking is going on is that this is some form of communication between above ground and below ground. If you look at, and we don't have time to read this, but if you look at other excavations of Scottish Atlantic Iron Age settlements in the Highlands and Islands, or the Solace in North Europe, you'll find precedent for this. And at Solace, they argued that what was going on in terms of the querns over a pit was that they were pouring libations through this reused quern feature. And I think that it's a good chance that when we excavate the flow deposits inside the city on a grid, we will find that directly underneath this hole, through the roof of the thing, we'll find different sorts of chemical signatures in the soil deposits right underneath. And I would be better than pouring something through the shell the shell is acting like a filter or a mesh or a sieve, possibly sieving out the lumpy bits. And the material, whatever it is, if it's a liquid, is dripping down into the interior of the suturane, and, it's, and, it's, and we hope it's leaving some kind of chemical signature in the flow deposit. And to give you an example of how this might work out, at a, a similar period site, High Pasture Cave in Skye in the West of Isles, they found a metre thick deposit of material at the entrance to a cave that had been used in the Iron Age. And when they analysed the chemical signature from that deposit, they found it was composed of a half a metre of compacted bull's blood, where <coughs> they envisaged that they'd been driving bulls up to the entrance of the cave, cutting their throats and letting the, the blood splatter at the entrance of the cave in some kind of seasonal implication or propitiation, some kind of ritual. 
some kind of seasonal ritual of that kind. I wouldn't mind betting that when we see the chemical signature from this, we'll, we'll find something similar. And one, one last closing closet, honestly, honestly, one last closing closet. This last year, just outside the Brock entrance, snug against the Brock wall, we started to uncover this funny thing, a strange thing, an arc of bone, and another very fascinating bone, a piece of human jaw, more mandible, within that arc of, of bone. As it started to develop, it became even weirder. So it became obvious this was a large piece of whalebone vessel carved, or a vessel carved from a large species of whale vertebrae. It started to get something weird emerging on one side of it during the excavation. That turned into antlers, two red deer antlers, two mature shed right side, right head side antlers, and so not the same individual found in the hill land, presumably, picked up, brought to the side, propped against the outside of this whalebone vessel with a human jawbone in it. There's more pictures of the whalebone vessel. That vessel also contained two neonatal lambs, deer bone fragments, um, various other juvenile portions of, of animal. So it looks like there's something really strange and interesting going on, another active deposition here. This is really, we dated this by radiocarbon dates, both the human remains and one of the lamb bones. And it's, it dates to exactly the moment in time, we think, when the brock was being put out of use. So it really doesn't look, it's a closing deposit. It's, it's announcing the end of the brock, as it were, and is really interesting. And to top it all off, some of the biographical details of the individual, the human individual, can be recovered, because locked away in his jawbone, when we came to radio carbon data, we could find that he had high marine protein levels in the bone chemistry. In other words, he had been consuming fairly large quantities of fish.